Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to Talking with Traders. This is the fifth season of the podcast to take us up to the end of 2022. Thanks to all our loyal listeners for returning and welcome to all our new listeners. As before, IG Markets have come on board as sponsors of this podcast. We're truly grateful to have such an award-winning CFD provider as sponsor alongside us. In this season, I'll welcome back some guests from the previous seasons of the podcast to get their updated market views. And we'll also be bringing in some new guests to the microphone too. As always, the aim with these podcasts is to give you the opportunity to listen to differing market views and to assist you with your own trading and investing education. So with that in mind, let's get straight into another episode of Talking with Traders. Welcome back to another episode of Talking with Traders. And this week, I'm delighted to welcome a new guest to the show. His name is Nick Kunzer. He might be a new guest to this show, but I'm sure he's not a new personality to many of you listening to this podcast. Nick is often on the TV and on the radio. He's got a long history in the market. Uh, we both worked at Nedbank together for a while, many years ago, Nick. But you've had quite a colorful history in the markets. You've worked at many different places in many different countries, well, a couple of different countries. So let's get into that. I mean, welcome to the podcast. And um, and I suppose to start things off, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into the mm -hmm. markets, and just in like two minutes, sketch the path that your career has taken to get to this point. Yeah, hi, Garth. Yeah, it has been a long time, man. Sure. Um, so where did it, where did it start? Um I always had a fascination with with the markets. I know most people uh, you maybe interview, I listen to a few of your shows, or say they do, but I generally, generally did. I mean, since my teens, and I think you were, if I look at your background, you're also sort of buying and selling shares in your teens, and that was me as well. Hmm. Um, and then uh, it was, I was about 16 years old, and uh, my grandfather had passed away, and uh, we were down in Durban at the time. I was a, I was a boarder up at, in Bothers Hill. And uh, the, one, the one sort of holiday, I went down with my mom to clean out his stuff. And uh, I remember going through all his, uh, his boxes and we're trying to find some, some memorabilia to take home with us while we're clearing it up. And we came across an old, an old trading journal. Well, I didn't know it was at the time. It was just an old, like a whole lot of bound, leather bound books, um, obviously before the days of, of internet. And it was boxes and boxes, and we started to go through it, and it was meticulously written daily sort of journals of, uh, you know, platinum shares at the time on the JSE, and bearing in mind, this was the late 80s, early 90s. Everything was handwritten. I can almost imagine him with his little pencil sharpening it, and you know, like the old days and plotting graphs. And uh, it turned out he had a reasonable uh, substantial amount of money in a broken account we didn't know about, and that sort of originally added to my original interest um of wanting to get into trading i mean to this day lessons learned i still keep a trading journal because of that um and then it was after i finished school i sort of uh was wondering what to do and i got on a plane 1992 and headed off to london to try and get a job on the on the futures exchange but that was that was my original perking of the interest and it's never really died quite frankly we're always still uh we're all still students of the market yeah that's true we never stop learning do we mm. now you're um you're currently at Sunland Private Wealth. Uh, mm -hmm. Your your link your LinkedIn says um, you're a macro portfolio manager there. Yeah. Uh, but I know that you've also you know been in quite a few different firms over the years. You also had your own firm, I think, for a while, didn't yeah. you? Mm -hmm. um, so just also tell us a little bit about that background, well, because we got to 1992 London, which I presume was oh. straight after varsity, straight after school. Yeah. Uh, is it, what, what have you done since then, really? Yeah, so, I mean, that led pretty much, so I wanted to get a job, but at the time, index index trading was where we had to be. This was the mid-90s, just to become in futures, and everyone had picked up market wizards and uh, reminiscence of stock operating, all these books were doing the rounds, and, you know, that's what I wanted to add up. So I ended up uh, getting a job as a runner on the London International Futures Exchange, mm -hmm. which was called Life. Yeah. Uh, and as I joined there, it was about 1994. And I just got a job as a runner, as a clerk, running around, working in the pits. Um, and I worked my way up uh, over the years to become an option market maker. 
Um, and fast forwarding a bit, the floor went electronic in about 97, 98. Um, and at the time, uh, there weren't many of us with much of a sort of a computer background. But I happened to know a little bit of programming. And I was pretty computer literate. So surrounded by, as you would know, we are now, but surrounded by a bunch of, of excess boys who, who couldn't really turn a, a computer on, mate. Um, <laughs> it was basically, I was the, the IT person. Um, and I ended up going up to the office and setting up the desk and setting up the, the trading desk to we were doing arbitrage at the time between Frankfurt and London uh, on the option pit. Um, and that's kind of where my journey started, Garth. I mean, after that, we just followed the money, you know, as life matured, as that uh, market became more and more saturated and the edge died up in the arbitrage, we found ourselves in Frankfurt for a number of years after that went we the next logical place was actually stockholm believe it or not which was the uh, omx which became the edx yeah. and those who are familiar with markets realize they actually end up buying the nasdaq so they were early early pioneers of screen-based trading yeah. and then i just followed the cash spent uh, 13 odd years um, abroad got to sort of early, sort of mid 90s at mid double o's and, uh, you know, we've done reasonably well. We're running a firm. We're market makers on all the different exchanges. And I just decided to, I wasn't married, had no kids, mm. um, just decided to take a year out, bit of a sabbatical, got on a plane and uh, came back to South Africa to see my folks, do a little bit of traveling, got the lecture from my mother about uh, not being married in my 30s. <laughs> and uh, I said I'd never, ever work for a bank again. I was actually planning to go to Hawaii, believe it or not, because a lot of the market makers were ending up there because uh, the South Korean exchange, the Cosby, was just taking off. And uh, the open interest and the trading on that, the volumes were like double Frankfurt or like our water. So that was kind of where I was thinking I was going. Uh, anyway, our previous boss, who you all know, Mr. Buchner, mm -hmm. um, offered Arthur, me a Arthur job Buchner. Yes, yeah. Yeah. On, uh, on, at Nedbank Capital. And I said, you know what, I'll work for like one month. You can pay me by the month. Uh, I'm just briefly here. I'm getting on a plane very soon. Never, ever working for a bank again. And that was uh, 16 years ago. I'm still there. <laughs> That's kind of my story. Yeah. But between that, being back in SA, also a very enjoyable career. Um, headed up first uh, what became FNB Securities desk when it was bought by after BJM days. Um, I was with you, obviously, at Nedbank Capital, very exciting times at 08 and all the ups and the downs. Yeah. Uh, ended up running my own hedge fund for a while, but my biggest mistake with that, I think, was trying to do it on my own, which is battle with costs, et cetera, nowadays with compliance. Yeah. I mean, after, while I was still trying to piece that together, I was offered a job back in the indus back in, uh, industry, and I ended up uh, at the time at what was Greenwood Asset Management, what became Bridge. Bridge got bought by Sunlum, and uh, I got part of the package, now I'm back at Sunlum for a while. So it's an interesting journey, a lot of it out of my control, but all very enjoyable and all just adding to your to the learning curve. So I've gone from being option market maker and open aircraft floor to now managing uh, sort of client money as a portfolio manager in Sunlum. So yeah, I've cut, yeah. I've cut my teeth is the long answer. Sorry, it was yeah. long-winded. Yeah, no, well, it's brilliant. Thank you very much. It's great. It's always great to get a an insight into someone who's got quite a you know quite an interesting history like yourself mm. in various parts of the world as well. But let's get into the meat of this conversation about you know talking with traders and trading and investing. Mm. Um, I always like to differentiate between what is trading and what is investing. Now, obviously, this podcast is talking with traders, but to be honest, it's not always just traders that we talk to because there are overlaps between trading and investing and, and there's mm. a place for both, although both are very different skills and quite different disciplines and require quite a different approach to the market. But I guess, you know, where do you, first of all, uh, put yourself, I, I mean, I'm guessing mm. more into the investor camp now that you're mm. managing macro portfolios mm. for clients. Um I mean, first of all, I, I, am I right? I'm saying that. Huh? You, you yeah, so, so, consider I mean, yourself if, more an investor than a trader nowadays. Yeah. So, so, so where I sort of find myself as an investor, we do manage long-term money and, and, and uh, you know, we are long-term investors and, and my role certainly has that in place. Notwithstanding that, we still have a lot of trading clients who trade through the desk, et cetera. Yeah. So I'd probably lean myself uh, still, I would say in the middle. I'm not, I wouldn't put myself in either camp now, Although lessons learned as a trader, ironically, I think are more applicable now um, with the markets. I mean, volatility, the swings. I mean, I don't think I'd ever see a day in my life that uh, 
UK government gilts would move, you know, 40, 50 basis points an hour. I mean, it's it, unless you're in the market and you are, these things are not supposed to happen. So ironically, I think that uh, that trading sort of uh, flavor is starting to actually help at the moment. So I'm in the middle, um, but uh, I think having that trading background definitely helps uh, navigate these current environments. Yeah, yeah, quite, quite right. So, in your experience, then, and you've dealt with many, many clients mm-hmm. over the years, uh, and as you say, in trading and in investing. But, I mean, on average, I suppose, which do yeah. better from your experience, the trading clients or the investing clients? Um, you know, over the long run, which who, who generate the better returns, the more sustainable returns, in your experience? Okay, there's there's your key right there. The more sustainable returns, mm. the, like we all know, it's easy to make a million. It's the keeping it right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the more sustainable returns are without doubt the long term investors. But let me just put a little asterisk there because uh, this is talking with traders. Um, but saying that, this very small percentage of good traders I've worked with, their returns blow any long term investing out the water. It's a very, very small batch of good, successful people who trade with their own money. I'm not talking about hedge fund guys. Guys actually trade with their own money. I know a couple of them. There's only a few of them left 15, 20 years later. Their returns are ridiculous. Um, Nothing in investing will ever come close to that. So in broad base, long-term investing, definitely better for the long term. But the small percentage who are good at what they do trading, I think they're a minority, but no no, no long-term investing will ever come close to the returns they're able to generate. Obviously, significantly more risk. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's like anything in 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 life. You know, you get at the sharp end, you you'll get those who are incredibly successful, but there's yeah. a lot that are not. And I, I mean, if we had to make a sporting analogy, I guess it's like golf, right? Mm. We can all go and have a round of golf, and you'd like to play golf, or maybe some of us do. Um, but how many actually make money out of it, and how many make serious money out of it? A very very tiny percentage, and it's the same in the trading world, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. You know, years ago, you would have all heard the analogy about the 90, it was a 90, 10 or whatever the numbers are. And most uh, most websites now, including your sponsor, IG, for example, you have to put on just like how many of the investors are losing money on what they do in these in, in leverage products, that is. Mm. And and, and the, the, those odds never change. It's literally mm. 80, 85%. I don't know what the number is, Garth. It's probably hard. Yeah, right they now. Lose money long term. Yeah. That is a fact. Yeah, I think when I, looked, when I looked, when I looked on... Yeah, IG's website has it currently. I think it's seventy six percent of yeah. clients are losing money, and I've seen. I mean, because I watch it every time you log into the website, that's the first thing that that exactly. you look at, and it, it. I think it's. I've seen it as low as sixty eight percent, which mm-hmm. is like the best I've ever seen it, and and up as you say into the low to middle eighties at times. So it, the point is, the majority of people who are trying to trade their own money yeah. lose money. Yeah, and let me just add there as well, God. Normally with the leverage, you know, the leverage is a killer. You know, those yeah. who do trade with gearing or borrowed money yeah. typically will lose more money than they make, and that's that's just a brutal fact. And uh, yeah. if you are that very small percentage that make, you are good at what you do. Yeah, that's it. You look. I mean, you and I have both been uh, brokers. I mean, uh, when we were working together at NetBank, I was running the retail side of the single stock yeah, futures yeah. desk, and we saw right during the middle of that market. Goodness yeah, me. yeah, it was fun times. Well, until two thousand and eight, then it wasn't much fun, and that mm. was you know two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. We saw clients who had made a fortune in the bull market using leverage get absolutely wiped out in in the crash of 2008 and 2009 and some of the numbers just are, are eye-watering um, and it comes back to yes leverage and lack of uh, respect for risk management mm-hmm. lack of respect for proper position sizing etc i suppose you know in a way i'm now leading into the next question and perhaps answering mm-hmm. it so i'll stop talking and ask you the question you know in your experience those traders who who are the successful ones? And you say you've seen some, they're the minority, mm. but nevertheless, there are yeah. they do exist. The guys who make a hell of a lot of money trading, what do they do differently? What differentiates them from the other, you know, 90, 95% or whatever who who just don't really make it or or you know or, or, I mean, or the, ma- the, barely get by? The first thing that springs to mind is a quote that my first boss gave me on the floor. Uh, and that was when I joined up, he said, Nick, I don't mind if you're wrong, you know, you make mistakes, it's, you're not a machine, these things happen. If you stay wrong, you will be fired. 
do not stay. I don't mind you making a mistake. Just get out of it and move on. And I've kept that to this day. And I mean, I see you smiling. You know all about these things. Yeah. That is exactly those guys who, who've made successful money. They're unemotional. And I'm sorry, girls as well. Yeah. They're unemotional. They are, um, and they are brutal when it comes to losing trade. Get out of it. And they don't even they don't even bat an eyelid. Yeah. Don't, yeah, it goes against a boom. Get out. And it was a quote. One of the one of the quotes also came across regarding like margin calls as well. When you start, if you're a trader with with gearing. And you start getting margin calls consistently. Guess what that is? I mean, that's the alarm bell. You're wrong. You're on the wrong side of it. Get out of it. And uh, for me, that in, a, in, in its pure basic sense, those who do make money long term, they just don't stay wrong. Yeah, uh, absolutely right. And I mean, we, we've seen many of the statistics in some of the trading books. You can make money as a trader with a hit rate of less than 40% less than 30 percent even in some cases mm -hmm. the key to it is when you're wrong get out lose as little as possible on those losing trades make as much as possible on the winning yeah. trades and and that you're absolutely right i mean and that's we, I don't, you know that. Carl, I mean, that that philosophy hasn't stayed since those who read reminiscences of a stock operator jesse livermore in 1900 yeah. Yeah. It had, that basic philosophy has not changed lift the winners right or cut your losses yeah and it's such a simple thing yet it's not easy to do for most no. people. It's impossible to people because human nature doesn't admit you're wrong. I mean, I see it all the time with with well-established fund uh, managers who sit in a position and they write it down and it doesn't go on. You sort of look at them going, just cut it. No one cares. You know, yeah. cut it. Find the next trade. Yeah. But two years later, you're still wearing it. And that's when it becomes a problem because then clients turn around to the manager and say, well, it's down 40% this particular stock. Yeah. Why haven't you cut it? Yeah. Uh, but it's human nature. Like you still, yeah, anyway. Emotion and human nature. I guess it's it's you know why why is it so difficult to cut a loss? It's what is it? Well, a you're accepting that you've lost the money. B yeah. you're admitting defeat. You've got it wrong, right? And that is mm -hmm. kind of goes against our egos, especially as guys. Maybe that's why sometimes it's believed that women make better traders because they don't have egos mm -hmm. like we huh. do as guys. You know, and 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 I suppose the third thing is that it's you, you're kissing goodbye the hope that this trade is ever going to come right for you. It's quite easy to hold on to hope mm -hmm. and believe that tomorrow is going to be a better day. <clears throat> but giving up that hope is part of the challenge. But you have to do it. <clears throat> you have to do it. And you know, nowadays, Scott, there's, there's so many uh, automated trading systems available off the shelf. There's platforms you can use. A lot, a lot of the, the online platforms that you can rent uh, to bolt onto the back end of your broker, they all offer rules, rules-based system trading, systems you can put in place to, to automate to a certain extent your very basic stuff sitting at home. Yeah. So there actually is, uh, if you stick to those rules and you put those rules on a computer, there's actually no excuse why you should be still wearing something. Because if you are doing that, it means you've overwritten those rules. You've yeah. basically gone and going shoot uh, you know it's going lower but let me just cut my stop loss and lower it a little bit more you just change the rules yeah so yeah rules stick to the rules as our, our business is, as traders is rule-based stick yeah. to the rules mm, absolutely <clears throat> what you said there about long-term positions where you see fund managers even that have got positions that mm. they can ride and ride them down 40 percent 50 percent or whatever that kind of leads me into the next question and this is a little bit more of a sort of an investor related question yeah. i suppose but i'm going to pose it to you because you said you've got to foot in both camps um, a lot of people ask me on the things that i do courses and seminars and whatever uh, they, they say well, how do you apply stop loss to a long-term position because it's quite easy I think it's quite easy to apply a stop loss to a short-term trading position. Yeah, it goes below a certain level, you exit, good night, thank you, goodbye. What about a long-term position where your intention with the stock is to hold it for the long-term and maybe it serves you very well for an extended period of time, but then it starts to turn against you. You know, we <clears> think that there, there are dozens of examples of this on the JSE and I suppose now we can also include dozens of examples globally as well. But I mean, the ones we, we're most familiar with on the JSE are stocks like EOH and Steinhoff, which were superb winners for a long period of time. You can pause probably bring Aspen into this as well. The Aspen hasn't mm. collapsed to the same extent as those other two shares have, but it's nevertheless gone from being a, a hell of a successful winner for many people. And it's down, you know, probably three quarters from its peak. Um, so, you know, how do you apply a stop loss to these long-term positions so that you mm. stay in when the going is good, but you get out when the going is turning against you and how do you identify that i suppose so that you've mm. it's a difficult one to 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 mm. try and 
it is, balance, it isn't is, it? It is a difficult one because investing and trading, even though they do have overlaps, are quite different styles. Um, and I will, let me say outright, I'm firmly in the camp of stop losses. I mean, I, you know, on an order entry window, my very basic system, I'll put a stop loss in before I put my take profit level, before yeah. I put my limit price in. That is, yeah. that's my background. Um, with with long-term management, uh, I do think to a certain extent you should have losses. I mean, why, why wear something down so much? I guess uh, where long-term asset managers have a luxury, which short-term leverage guys probably don't, is that is your time they've got time on their sides they can wear it through um and i guess with the long-term asset management investing side as well you never massively expose we shouldn't be to one single position you usually have a diversified portfolio if you're running a, a core equity fund you might have three four five six seven percent in a share you know maybe wearing one of those shares down 30 40 percent is not going to ruin your clients christmas it just is what it is with trading it's a very different you probably have one or two concentrated positions that's going to really hurt um, but no, I'm, I'm uh, long-term investing. Should there be stop losses? I think. To, I think if the rule again, if the rules change with long-term investing, if the stock you bought had really good free cash flow, say for example, you bought a retailer uh, and their their trading update was good, the retail figures were decent, you ride it. But if the, the rules change, if in, in this current environment, if interest rates are rising, if the retailer is under pressure and the stock starts going down. And I think to a certain extent, you should have a, in inverted commas, a stop loss. The rules have just changed on that position. And I've actually, quite frankly, in my experience recently, um, is that I don't think clients actually mind if, you, if you're long-term investor and you get out of a share. You know, they, they, I think people are quite financially literate now and they understand it. So, yeah, I'm firmly in the camp. If something goes against you, long-term investor or short-term trader, get out of it, look for the next one. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's talk a little bit now about the current market environment. Um, this is we, we're recording this on the nineteenth of October, twenty twenty two. For anyone that happens to listen to this podcast in the future, just to put a, a timestamp on it, um, we're in tricky times in the markets. I mean, we're we've had lots of noise has been made about the fact that this has been the worst start to a year in terms of a 60-40 portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds, mm -hmm. the worst start to a year since the 1930s, which is obviously Great Depression time. Mm -hmm. um, it's we're, we're in tricky times. You know, Large parts of the world are s suggested to be going into recession. It's been a bear market since January of this year. Um, Company earnings, okay, we're in the thick of third quarter earnings season now, and some of the earnings coming out of the US are actually a little bit better than what some might have mm. been expecting, which has surprised me to some extent. Yeah. Um, but what is your outlook at this point in time? I mean, we, it's it's a bear market. I mean, I presume you agree. I don't know if you do. Uh, what do we what, what, give us a bit of thoughts on your perspectives and where we are right now in the global economy and in terms of the equity investment environment? Mm. So, Garth, I think I think it must be sort of argued and my thoughts put forward against the contents of where we've come from. So after 2008, the great financial crisis, you know, the world inherently changed. Central banks became the rock stars of our industry. Uh, they pulled all the leverage, the, the levers. They... Um, they introduced something called quantitative easing, which in all intents and purposes was a was a giant project to to you know to keep the economy alive. And for whether you want to argue against or not, I think at the time it was needed to be. The world couldn't stomach another Great Depression. Anyway, that's the background. So so 12, 14 years later, we're finding ourselves starting 2022 with that giant experiment now becoming unwound. You're having quantitative tightening, although, you know, the UK might be, there's a question mark with the Bank of England just sort of sidestepping the last day. But so that liquidity is now coming out of the system. You're in an environment where you were awarded, you had to take risk because you got nothing on your money. You didn't, you could, the money policy was zero. You had, you had negative yielding bond yields in places like Denmark. I don't think I've ever read an economic book in my life that anywhere under zero bound that goes negative. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. so, the, so that whole environment was completely upside down and, and, and bizarre. And not to a certain extent, I guess, 
it might be painful, but we are returning to some sense of normality. And that's been accelerated because of the war in Ukraine, inflation. We all know the inflation story. We had the UK inflation print this morning, double digit once again. They're hoping for under 10, came in at 10.1. Mm. Um, so, so inflation is here. So the world has changed. So, so where are we in the cycle? I think in a good sense, not being doom and gloom, in a, in a good sense, we are returning to normal. Interest rates are getting to where they should be. Long-term bond yields are going to be back at 3 4 5%, possibly 10-year yields. All of that is good. All of that is good. So your 60-40 diversified portfolio has just been absolutely hammered is because those bonds didn't offer diversification because the giant 10-year experiment of artificially yields being kept low and curve, whatever Bank of Japan used to call it, I mean, yield curve control, all that is being unwind. But the good news, the good news for all of us traders, investors, is we're going to get back to normal. But... That path back to normality, I think, is fraught with risks, Garth. And I think, uh, you know, it's not going to be easy. So where are we? I think we're probably halfway, maybe a little bit more. Um, but the good news is, I think, but if we have this conversation at this time in 12 months, in a year's time, I think it'll look better than it does now. Yeah, okay. That Your views pretty much concur with mine. Um, mm -hmm. I was interested to hear from you on that because you've you've been in the market longer than I am. Mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of, I don't know, you probably... 10 odd years older than me, maybe not quite. Um, but you were around to see the dot-com crash, and which I was still at varsity during the dot-com yeah. crash. So, you know, as much as I saw it and I got to experience what it was like to lose a lot of money in dimension data call warrants uh, mm. as, a, as a youngster, you know, I, I kind of saw that bear market from a very naive perspective. Um, I was around for the financial crisis in, the, in 08, 09, obviously you were. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of the third, I guess for both of us, <laughs> it's the third bear market that we're really, the third proper bear market that we're experiencing. Um, but you've, you you've know, sort of you seen what, more. Hmm? You know what really bothers me about this, this particular time is that in 2008, it was the greedy banks. We all know that. It was the subprime mortgages. You've all seen the movies, you read the books. That was mm -hmm. to dot .com the same, the extreme are watering valuations that shouldn't have been there. What concerns me about this is that the ones that are causing all this problem work for the government. You know, yeah. it's, it's the central bankers, those ones that were, uh, you know, the rock stars, you know, that we faced running around with the, the, the Yellens and the Bernankes. They are now putting the levers that is probably going to tip and is tipping the world in recession because of this experiment, uh, I think is is going to be so un so difficult to unravel. So it's difficult. That, that's what that's what concerns me is that the central bank, the ones as I said, that are running the governments, are pulling the levers that are possibly making this time more complicated than the other times. Yeah. Because you could blame the banks. You could let a you could let Bear Stearns fail. You could you know you could let those things go to the wall. You can't let a Swiss national bank go to the wall if it'll bring the world down. Yeah. So it's a very, very difficult balancing and these central bankers have got. Yeah, I guess this is like the, you know, this is the final backstop, isn't it? You know, Correct. we've previously kicked the can down the road. Like you said, quantitative easing just did kick a can down the road for a very long time, possibly a lot longer than what many people thought was was likely. But maybe they've run out of road now. There's no more road to kick that can down. Exactly. And I mean, I mean, when you give people free money, when you have interest rates at zero, people do stupid things. Yeah. They borrow, they, they, their businesses exist that shouldn't exist because your cost of capital is zero. Mm. So they push this can, push this pan. We've all known the Bernanke put and all the stuff. Well, that's kind of gone now. So again, I reiterate, without, uh, out, like jumping out the window behind me, all doom and gloom, um, we are just returning to normal. Um, and those businesses and and enterprises that can't operate in an environment with normal interest rates will probably go under. I don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah. Um, and as you said, I think that kicking the can, to use your analogy, I think we, we're getting to the end of that road now, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's it, right? From these types of events, you do get a nice clean, cleansing of the system. And I agree with you. No, but money shouldn't be free. There should always be a cost of capital. And it's and money has effectively been free for far too long. And as you say, that's where you start to get all sorts of strange things happening. Asset bubbles emerge and mm -hmm. you know, things like crappy uh, 
cryptocurrencies that should be worth zero go you know ridiculously expensive non fungible tokens mm. you get all of these asset bubbles that create that, Text, that inflate textbook stuff in absolutely the i mean and, and and in a way i suppose you know we talked about dot com this is like the, the another version of that dot com bubble that is now unraveling spectacularly mm. but having said that right as i mentioned this is for both of yeah. us i suppose our third um, bear market, that proper, proper third bear rodeo. market, third rodeo, right? That we're okay. both experiencing. And we know from experience, having done it twice before, we know from experience that out of these things, out of these bear markets come incredible opportunities on the other side, if you can survive it and if you can keep powder dry and you've got capital available to put to work on the other side of this. Selfishly, that's what I'm super excited for. Because mm -hmm. on the other side of this bear market, after this washout, once valuations get back to more reasonable levels, there will be opportunities to put capital to, to, to work uh, for the next big up cycle. So in that vein, you know, what do you look at? Where, where, what, because I presume we've all got to be making a shopping list right now, right? Yeah. And putting that shopping list together and having it sitting on your desk there so that when the stocks come past your screen and they're at these ridiculously low valuations you want to start putting your money to work so what sort of themes are, are you looking at to potentially mm. capitalize on in the next up cycle when it comes mm. so yeah so i mean that's exactly my word that you used theme when i speak to clients that's exactly what i talk about now what is the theme so let's figure out the theme let's figure out how we take advantage of it and i want to try be a little i'm not uh you know, I'm not that smart. There's smarter people out there, but I do want to at least be able to jump on a theme when I see it. I want to be first, but I'm not going to be last. I want to be part of it. So what are the themes we're seeing in place? Well, we all know the the, the, the buzzword for now, probably, it's probably going to be the, I don't know, Time Magazine word of the year is probably going to be, in, you know, inflation. You know, we are in an inflationary, inflationary environment. It's been that way since the start of the year that transitory rubbish that these central banks lived in, in the usual expression, that lovely hope trade, that ain't going to happen. So inflation is, is with us. And central banks are rising, are raising rates. We're getting rising yields. We're getting, we've got a war in the Ukraine. We've got a dollar that is rampant. So those are all the themes that I'd, I'd, I'd put down on a table to clients and say exactly what you said. There's going to be a massive opportunities. How do you make money in that? Well, in that environment, things like from an equity point of view, Banks do phenomenally well. You've seen, you, you touched on the earnings season. We had JP Morgan on Friday, but we've had uh, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, great set of numbers because the cost of capital is rising and the spread they make on that is getting bigger. So financials will do very well in a higher interest rate environment. They always do. Locally, the South African banks, Standard Bank came up with a trading update this morning, if you're listening to the show, absolute blowout number, stocks up 5%. Banks are cheap. So financials do well in this in this particular environment on that theme. And commodities, Garth, um, I mean, I'm not a massive commodity bull, but um, you know, commodities have come under pressure recently because of this rampant dollar. So those who are traders out there, stick the dollar on the top of your watch list right now, the dollar index, whatever crosses you're looking at. You know, if this dollar starts at some point to roll over, which it will, because inflation is not gonna go up forever, That'll be your key to to dive in and look at some of the some of the commodities, soft commodities even. So I think, yeah, as you said, uh, well, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Um, mm. That's kind of a theme I'm pricking clients for um, going forward. And okay. I'm just to reiterate, if you whatever your long term portfolio was in the last year or two, if it still looks like it did, and your asset manager still has the same stuff a year or two ago, you need to change your asset manager because we're heading into a new theme. Yeah. Um, and you adjust accordingly. And, and as you said, opportunities abound. Mm. I suppose it's an opportunity. It's we're, we're entering a, a, a value overgrowth kind of an environment, yeah. right? Where Spot. you, you, no, you the, mentioned tech, you're right. Yeah. yeah, because because everything that's worked in the past, like you said, has been your tech. It's been your long duration growth assets. Mm -hmm. You know the Teslas and all the, these types of things with where you you might get your return in some at some future date quite long down the line in a high interest rate environment you know you you're more impatient to get your return mm -hmm. so and, and, and not putting anything away from the tech pioneers out there the apples the the phenomenal businesses i mean they're sitting on massive cash files and and yeah they took advantage of a zero interest rate environment um and and good for them uh, i'm not discounting tech but let's just say 
not all tech is the same. You know, yeah. if you if you're on the edges or you're not making money in last year's zero interest rate environment, you're probably unlikely to make money if uh, your cost of capital is up fourfold. But something like a you know an Apple sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars in cash doesn't really make a difference to them. Mm. But yeah, I definitely I, I agree. I would agree with you. I think value will. Uh, you got some quality value shares trading at five, six, seven PEs. It's compared to the techs at fifties and sixties. I do think value will start to come back in the next year or two. So mm. I'm on the same page. Yeah, yeah, looks like it. All right, excellent. I think as we round, wind down towards the end of the podcast, Nick, uh, you know, we always try and keep these podcasts mm. to around about 40 minutes. It's it's my view that that's a good enough lump of time for people to listen to while yeah, they're doing some, asleep, some, yeah. some exercise or ride, driving in your car or, you know, traveling on the train into mm. London, as I'll be doing tomorrow. 40 minutes is always a good chunk of time, I think, for a podcast. Um, so we're nearly at that point, but I'm going to wrap up with this final question. Mm. And this is for maybe the younger listeners to this podcast. Uh, if you go back, let's say you're a Nick Kunza and you're 16 years old again, and you're you know, at that stage where you're going through your, your grandfather's trading journal and you're starting to get interested in the markets and you could do it all again. Now, as some other youngster comes to you in, and he's also 16 or 17 or 18 years old, interested in getting into the markets, finds it fascinating. What advice would you give to that person? Or what advice would you give to 16-year-old Nick Kunza, who's just starting out his career? Hmm. So, I mean, a number of things spring to mind. First and foremost, knowledge. You can never learn enough. And I, I think I mentioned it when we started chatting. You know, you're always a student of the markets. So uh, you, myself, everyone else doesn't know how old you are. You're constantly learning. And you, and, and, and markets constantly involve. So the the I guess the lessons looking back is you you got to learn to 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 move with the markets. Things change. We touched on it on the show. Themes come and go. So you need to change with that environment. And, and from more simplistic level, I guess for those who want to trade and I, and I love markets. You know this is this is my passion. This is what I I'm still one of those few people that you know wake up at four in the morning to see what Hong Kong's doing. Honestly, even this yeah. long while kicks me in the bed but yeah. you know this it's just it's in my blood this is what i've done um if, for other people out there i think also i think it's quite important when you're starting out to make sure you've got enough capital because you're going to make mistakes i made the mistake from you know saving a couple of thousand dollars and diving into dollar yen and of course you you know the, the moves you get blown out in a, in a day or two and you start again Remember, your capital is all you've got. You, that is how you make your money. So I think in hindsight, if I could give any advice, if it takes you a year or two longer than you want to to save money, to trade with, make sure you've got enough capital because you need to withstand the ups and the downs and, and you're going to need to withstand that margin call we spoke about. Yeah. That was my first thing. Uh, and second of all, risk management. You know, often I get irritated when, when people talk about trading the markets, but we actually don't trade the markets, you and I, Garth. We, we, we buy and sell risk. We yeah. trade risk, risk management, change your mindset, put that on a post note on your trading screens, whatever you're doing at home, manage your risk. You want to be in this for the long term. You want to make as much money as possible. Uh, and the only way to do that is managing your risk. So, I mean, those are, those are the kind of things I'd urge listeners and people starting out, uh, guys and girls, that that's where you start. Risk management, make sure you have enough cash and just keep on learning and have a passion for this game because it's one of the few businesses that I've been in that I can genuinely tell you after this long, as you said, I'm older than you, mm -hmm. um, that those who do your homework, there is a direct correlation between the work you put in and the amount that you get out. And this is why I love this business. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, I think we, we 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 cut from the same cloth in that sense. I'm also up at four in the morning. And the first thing I do is have a look at my phone to see where the, <laughs> where the Asian markets are trading and where the US futures are and what the currencies mm -hmm. are doing. I mean, it, it does become, it, it's passion, right? And it's mm -hmm. so interesting. No, no one. It's not day. a job, is it? It's not a no, job. It's not. I don't it's really view job. it as it. Well, it is what I do for a living, but it's sick. I love it. I mean, if I didn't do this, I don't know what I would do, but even if I was doing something else, I would still want to do this as a hobby because it's so much fun and it's so interesting. And on that point about risk management, there's a saying I always love, um, and it's not a new one. don't know where it came yeah. from, but it's that old saying, but a bit of a poker analogy, but it's if you don't bet, you can't win. But if you lose all your chips, you can't bet. And um, And I suppose that's a good note to end this on for those listening uh, in terms of the risk management that you were talking about. It's very important to keep yourself in the game 
uh, don't lose all your chips. Nick, it's been a super experience chatting to you. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, it's been, well, as I say, around about 40 minutes. Thanks very much for giving up your time. And I would love to have you back on the podcast probably another year from now to catch up once again. It's always good to get Here previous previous mm -hmm. guests back on. I'm sure that in a year from now, we'll have a lot more to talk about in terms of what the market's done. Maybe by then it would have bottomed out and it would have given us some of those eye-watering opportunities that we alluded to during the conversation today. Thanks, Garth, and thanks so much again for inviting me on. I loved it. Perfect. You take well. Keep well. Cheers. You're listening to Talking with Traders, a podcast series brought to you by IG, a world-leading online trading and investment provider. If you haven't checked out the IG online trading platform, please do so and visit IG.com. Also, make sure you subscribe to the podcast series on your favorite podcast app or website by clicking on the subscribe button and you'll be notified weekly as we release new episodes. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking with Traders brought to you by IG, a world leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.